All right, I'm going to get started now. Hello everyone and welcome to Managing Tourette Syndrome and Anxiety During COVID-19. My name is Shauna Chance and I'm the Executive Director for the Southern California Chapter. And I just wanna make a brief note, to learn more about our chapter or to donate, please visit SoCalTAA.org. Before our feature presentation, we are going to hear brief remarks from MLX Biosciences. And to do that, we have David Kim with us. David, welcome. Thank you. Appreciate the time. And let me share your slides. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Awesome. Thank you very much. And you actually updated the slides with my name on it. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I just want to thank the TAA before we get started uh, for giving us uh, a few minutes here to talk about the study that we're doing in Tourette's. Um, my name is David Kim. Uh, I'm a senior director of clinical operations for MLX. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the company and the study that we're doing. But before I do so, I know um, Meredith Miller is always also on the line. She works with us at MLX. I want to see if I can have her introduce herself uh, quickly before we start on the slides. Yeah, thank you, David. Hi, this is Meredith Miller. I'm Associate Director of, uh, of Clinical Operations at MLX, and I work with David on the Tourette's program. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone for the time um, today. We look forward to discussing the study with you. All right. Uh, thanks, Meredith. So she and I are sort of our tag teams. Uh, we're associated at the hip uh, for these two studies that are ongoing uh, right now uh, for us. Um, so uh, before we begin about the study, maybe I can give a quick introduction about MLX Biosciences, since I'm, most, I'm sure most of you haven't heard about uh, our company. Uh, we're a small company. We had um, established in 2018. We're based in Chicago. Um, we're a company uh, dedicated to developing new treatments for neurologic uh, conditions uh, where unmet medical need exists. Um, we, our primary mission is to develop and register and distribute commercialized treatments that address unmet medical needs uh, with new FDA-approved therapies um, or diseases with FDA therapies that are inadequate uh, due to limitations of data, uh, efficacy or safety data uh, at the moment. Um, we are particularly interested in rare and orphan diseases, um, and our leading candidate right now is Echopipam, which we'll be uh, talking about uh, in the threat studies coming, coming up uh, in the next few slides. Next slide. So just to give you a little bit of background information on Echopipam, um, it's a, a drug that's not been approved for any indication uh, anywhere in the world. As of yet, um, it's a selective antagonist of a uh, D1 receptor. Um, they've shown in potential improvement in Parkinson motor symptoms, um, so uh, it may so it may show improvement in hyperkinetic movement disorders. Um, as far as we know, there are no uh, other selective D1 antagonists under development. Um, so far, we've studied over 2,000 subjects in several indications. Uh, mainly uh, weight loss in adults uh, by sharing plow and later by Sidon, uh, which we bought the compound from uh, a few years ago. Um, at Sidon, they did a, two small studies, both adults and adolescents with uh, Tourette's, and which we are uh, continuing in, um, at MLX right now. Um, Again, MLX, we're developing uh, for Tourette's, as well as uh, we just started uh, a study in adults with uh, childhood onset frequency disorder or stuttering as well. So to uh, go a little bit more detail into, this, uh, into the study, it's called, Di it's called a diamond study. Uh, it's for Tourette's syndrome in children uh, 6 to 17 years of age. Um, we're looking at uh, to find out, obviously, if it works in children and adults with Tourette syndrome. Um, to be eligible, they need to be 16 to 17 years old. Uh, as long as they're 17, year old, 17 years old at screening, 
Um, obviously, they can turn 18 while they're in the study. Uh, they need to be diagnosed with Tourette syndrome and also have both motor and vocal tics that interrupt normal routines. Um, this is a 22-week study with about eight clinic visits and three phone calls uh, as part of a study. Uh, there'll be two clinic visits uh, for screening and uh, baseline, uh, three clinic vi uh, visits uh, that their, the child will be assigned to either placebo or the study drug, and they will compete uh, questionnaires uh, and lab tests uh, to look at efficacy and safety data. Uh, there will also be two phone calls to ask about any side effects or any safety um, issues that they're having uh, with the drug. Um, and there'll be one clinic visit at the uh, end of the study uh, or at uh, if the or if the uh, subject decides to withdraw from the study. Uh, and there'll be two follow-up clinic visits seven days and 14 days after uh, the child completes or withdraws from the study, and then month follow-up phone call to see uh, if they're still doing okay uh, once they're off a of drug. Um, Right now, you can go take a look at uh, clinicaltrials.gov to get more information uh, on participating sites uh, uh, on the study. And also, we've been working with Tracy at TAA, um, and I believe that we are up on their website uh, link, and you can um, click on the link to get more information about the study um, moving forward. Right now, uh, we are in the middle of the study right now. We have about 70, close to 80 patients enrolled, uh, all in the U.S., all in U.S. and Canada. We're about to open sites in Europe. Uh, right now, hopefully today or tomorrow, we'll have drug available for them uh, to enroll subjects in Europe. Um, there is about, uh, Mary, if you can correct me if I'm off here, I'm always not remembering exactly how many sites. There are about 47 sites avail uh, open and actively recruiting patients uh, in US and Canada. Uh, I believe we also have uh, several sites in Cal uh, Southern California, uh, University of Irvine, and one in San Diego. Dr. McManus and Dr. McGuire are both uh, PI investigators in Southern California uh, that are open and actively recruiting patients right now. Um, that's probably all my slides. Uh, does anybody have any questions that I may be able to answer? I know I went through them pretty quickly and it's just a very broad uh, update um, slides of, about the study. If anyone has any questions that you happen to think of later, please just put them in the chat and we will make sure that we pass those along to David and our friends at MLX. All right, David, thank you so much for sharing the information about your study. Well, thank you very much. I, again, I appreciate it. Uh, everybody's given us a few minutes to talk about our study. And if there's any questions at all, you can go through uh, your local chapter or um, hopefully uh, get the information on the, the website uh, and um, hopefully get uh, uh, those questions answered as quickly as possible. Fantastic. Right. And so now we are moving on to our featured presentation. And for that, I would like to introduce Emily Ricketts, PhD, and John Passantini, PhD. They are both with the UCLA Movement Disorders Clinic, a Tourette Association of America Center for Excellence. And before I turn it over to them, I will just ask everyone again, if you have any questions, so please put them in the chat and we will answer them for you. So now welcome Emily and John. Good morning, everyone, or afternoon. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Emily Ricketts, and this is John Passantini. Um, we, oh, you know what, hang on one second. <laughs> this is on automatic, and it's going to cause <laughs> me problems. Let me get rid of it. Um, there we go. Otherwise, it's going to keep advancing. OK. Um, so uh, we are uh, from the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences. Um, we're from the Child OCD Anxiety and Tick Disorders Program specifically. And uh, we are a Tourette Association Center of Excellence. 
So to provide an overview, um, today we will be um, addressing the impact that COVID-19 has had on um, youth and families. Um, we'll also be providing guidance on managing Tourette syndrome and anxiety surrounding COVID-19 and especially with the return to school. And we will also be giving you an overview of our Tourette Association of America Center of Excellence at UCLA. So now I'll hand it over to Dr. Passantini. Great, thanks Emily. And it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning um, or, or afternoon as, as Emily said. So we wanna start by just talking a little bit about the impact of COVID. Um, in our clinic, we are getting, um, um, you know, almost all of our treatment is remote now because of COVID. Um, there's certainly, we're living in a different era um, and we get a lot of questions from families about you know, how is this impacting Tourette's and, and what can we do to manage this? So I think we'll, we'll just start with a little bit of information on how things have changed and some of the issues that you as parents um, or educators or even clinicians um, might be, some of the issues you might be dealing with. Um, so this is um, a, a slide here that shows changes in parent reported parental mental health and child mental health changes. Um, and it's a little bit complicated, but basically what it shows is that from March to June 2020, 17% of parents reported that their physical health had deteriorated or was worse. And more importantly, perhaps if you look to the, to the right, the bars to the right, 27% of parents reported that their mental health had worsened from March to June, and that 14% um, of the kids had experienced similar worsening. So these are, these are pretty, big, pretty big numbers um, showing the impact of COVID. Uh, next slide, please, Emily. And if you, um, if you look here, what is the impact um, in terms of social distancing? So what kind of toll is social distancing taking? This was a survey of 1,200 parents of kids from kindergarten to 12th grade whose school was closed. And you can see that the parents reported that they were already experiencing harm to emotional or mental health. This was 30% of parents. 14% said they could only do this maybe a few more weeks, the social distancing with, with kids at home. About a quarter said they could do it a few more months. And then about a third said they could do it as long as necessary. Now, if you look at the date of the survey, this was May. So we are about four months past where these parents, many of these parents said they really were starting to reach the end of their, their limits with regard to this. And I think we know from personal experience and what we're seeing in, on the news and, and perhaps in conversations with, with other family and friends that, that it is getting quite difficult to manage um, COVID at, at home and being homebound. Uh, next slide. Um, in April, again, this is, this is uh, you're going to have to fast forward four or five months for this slide as well, um, 1,500 households, that half of kids in the U.S. were worried that a relative would get sick, half reported being bored or worried, one in three reported being scared, one in four reported being anxious, confused, stressed, or unhappy, and half of all youth, and again, this is in April, that they were worried that they will not have learned enough over the spring homeschooling um, to be ready for school in the fall. Well, we're now at fall and a lot of these kids are still homeschooled and some are back in schools, but we know that some of the kids that are actually back in schools are being compromised because of, of COVID outbursts. So um, kids are really worried about their educations now as our parents. So but what about parent perspectives? Again, this is in the April survey, so we do need to fast forward a few months here. Um, most parents report financial concerns, 70%. Quarter have lost wages or had a pay cut. That's probably worse now in some, in some areas, maybe a little better in others, given how things have been opening and closing. Um, two thirds of parents report concerns about not seeing older relatives. We know older relatives are at increased risk and, um, and, and many of them are not in a position to have physical contact with, with family members. Um, about 28% are managing working from home and childcare responsibilities, which is certainly a significant burden. And two thirds of parents, again, were concerned about their kids falling behind in school. Certainly these numbers have increased over this time. If we look at the impact of COVID on physical activity and sedentary behavior, 
what this slide, slide shows is that the, the um, dark bars, the solid bars, are for age five to eight year olds. You can see that um, physical activity has decreased some in the younger kids. But if you look at the nine to 13 year olds, um, you can see that almost half of these kids report uh, significantly less physical activity between um, February pre-COVID and April, May. Um, so it really is impacting. And I think this picture um, this, that Emily picked out for this talk is um, pretty <laughs> accurate. Kids are spending a lot of time being couch potatoes. Um, yeah, a lot more it, screen time. A lot more screen time, <laughs> exactly, than, than running around and playing time. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. And this is just the inverse. So you yeah. can see how much more on the, on the left now, the much more is how much more sedentary. And um, they are much less physically active and much more sedentary, which is which is which is is not something that we want to see in young kids. Next, um, this is also an interesting slide, um, and this shows where are kids spending most of their time. And again, pre-COVID to early COVID. So you can see, um, if you look at the hatched bars, where the hatched bars are higher, that means kids are spending more time now post-COVID, in home, in garage in yard, um, maybe a little bit on the sidewalks, you know, very close into the neighborhood. But if you look at these other areas, parks, indoor sports facilities, outdoor sports facilities, other kinds of neighborhood activities, again, physical activity, that activity has almost disappeared, um, which again is really something we don't wanna see um, with regard to our kids or even ourselves. Next slide, please. So there's a very significant potential impact um, of COVID on kids. So we're seeing just in general, but we know that kids with Tourette's and associated difficulties, um, the impact can really be magnified. We know that anxiety is very common in kids with Tourette's and anxiety really can exacerbate ticks. We know that from research that we've done. We know that from our clinical work. You know that from just experience. And there's no doubt that COVID has heightened anxiety and stress in both kids and parents and, and the community as a whole, which is more likely to lead to increased ticking. Kids are worried about the health and well being of themselves, their families, and their friends, again, which is going to be another trigger for, for potentially increased ticks and other symptoms such as ADHD, um, OCD. Um, we know that ticks are heightened in times of anxiety and stress, as which I've just said. And ticks mimic other symptoms in action. So kids with coughing ticks or sneezing ticks, throat clearing or sniffing, these can be interpreted as signs of, of potentially getting sick. And that can cause panic. Um, I certainly know with my own kids who are older, every time I feel like I'm gonna have a, have a tickle in my throat or a cough or a sneeze, oh my God, is it COVID? And um, <laughs> so you can see this with family members and kids and classmates and whatever it might be, just another stress laying on, layered on. And increased family time, especially for parents who are trying to work and manage kids and worried about their own things, maybe, maybe managing um, other family members that might be ill. The kids certainly feed off of this and we feed off our, our kids' concerns as well. We also work with OCD quite a bit in our clinic. OCD and Tourette's are quite comorbid. And we're seeing a lot of kids coming in with contamination fears um, and hand washing pre-COVID. Well, that certainly has been exacerbated as well. And it's hard to know how do you distinguish OCD worries from COVID, which can lead to additional stressors. Okay, so now we want to cover anxiety in a little bit more detail. So um, what is anxiety? So ultimately, anxiety is a fear response in the absence of a real threat. So in other words, anxiety is an emotional and physiological or bodily response to a perceived threat. So, um, you know, and this spans several dimensions. So feelings or affect, so, you know, feeling afraid and panic, um, you know, wound up, agitated, uh, nervous. Also um, cognitions or thoughts. So a lot of worry thoughts, um, what we call automatic negative thoughts. Um, having difficulty concentrating on the tasks at hand, and also attentional biases. And by this, what we mean is that people who are feeling anxious tend to hone in on particular um, 
aspects of others' behavior and the world around them. So they're honing, on, honing in on what they perceive as threatening. So for some people, this may be somebody's face, what, what their eyes are doing, a, a furrowed brow. It might be the tone of somebody's voice um, and, or somebody's body language. And so people who are anxious have a tendency to um, perceive threat in, in actions that might be more neutral um, to other people. Uh, also physiological bodily reactions. So that getting into that fight or flight response, that arousal, also stomach aches and headaches are quite common in kids who are feeling anxious who may not be able to report anxiety to you but may report these physical symptoms um, also uh, tension muscle tension having difficulty falling asleep staying asleep those are all common um, bodily signs but also um, behavioral reactions too um, so avoidance so that's a big one and and sometimes you'll see that in um, in people even when there's even when you don't observe other things other types of reactions um feeling fidgety and and restless um that's another another sign of anxiety um anger outbursts so you know feeling irritable um feeling sensitive and crying also um and freezing up going mute um also reassurance seeking is a big one and asking repeated questions. So, you know, is, is everything gonna be okay? Are we gonna be okay? Or just asking the same question, you know, over and over that you, you know, a parent has already answered. Um, and, and difficulty separating from parents too. So these are um, all, these can, are all signs of um, anxiety. There we go. <laughs> um, so now I want to touch on uh, normal developmental fears because it is normal to to have fears at at each um, developmental stage, um, and these, you know, having fears really protects us from the world around us. So it, you know, this is um, a normal thing, um, and what we'll find is is that these these fears tend to generally decline with age, um, but they also change in their nature and as, as the child has an expanding awareness of their world around them. So in infancy, what we'll find is that, you know, the child's are afraid of loud noises and strangers, um, stranger danger. And this is, you know, this is a natural innate um, protective uh, response. This is normal to feel that way. Um, in early childhood, um, we have, uh, fears of separation, um, fears of monsters, so not, not wanting to be away from a parent, wanting to stay close to the home environment. As children enter middle childhood and their perspective grows, they, they learn more about the world around them, they learn more about current events, um, natural, natural events in the world. Um, then you start to see uh, different kinds of um, you know, areas of worry, so it's more real world dangers. Could somebody break into the house? Um, could there be an earthquake? Uh, you know, it, and, you know, new challenges, um, you know, trying out for, um, you know, recreational activities, um, you know, the future, what could happen in the future. And once kids reach adolescence, um, it's more concerns about, you um, you know, fitting into the social scene around them, in group and out group. Um, you know, performing uh, performance-related concerns, uh, social judgment from others. So, you know, kids are trying to figure out, you know, who they are and how they fit in um, to the world ultimately. And um, so, what you what you see is, you know, it is normal to have these these fears, but when when a when a child is exhibiting um, fears that are outside of their developmental stage, that is when it, you start to see that this might be a problem. So that's one indicator. So if an adolescent is, you know, afraid to separate from from parents, um, you know, that is outside of uh, 
you know, their developmental stage. And so, you know, that, that is a good indicator that this, there may be something uh, wrong at that point. You know, if there's a teen who is constantly, you know, checking on the parents and phoning, wanting, you know, wanting to make sure the parent doesn't leave to go to work because they want to be close to them all the time, um, then we know that there, you know, there is a problem. And, and another thing to note is that once kids uh, enter adolescence, um, we, do, we do tend to see an increase in, in emotional, um, you know, emotional problems and also anxiety. And we, we do tend to see uh, an increase in uh, young women having these problems. So it tends to be more, more women than men, I would say that uh, affects, that anxiety um, affects, ultimately. And um, it's important to note that it it's also no, quite normal to have um, or experience um, brief periods of anxiety. Um, so, you know, this would be, these would be uh, feelings that are associated with, um, you know, very particular events. So entering a new or novel situation, having um, an upcoming uh, report at school, um, somebody teasing you, uh, phobias, thunder, things like that. Um, but, but ultimately what you would see is that this would not, uh, this wouldn't cause very much in the way of interference in your child's ability to function and go about their day or the family routine. So you're not going to see, um, as much in the way of distress or uh, interference in the flow of, you know, daily life. Um, and also the, the, the reactions or the positive reactions that come from actually engaging in, um, you know, the task uh, at hand that uh, the child is afraid of um, ultimately are rewarding um, and, and really overshadow the, the anxiety um, felt during the task or um, beforehand. So ultimately what we're seeing is that, you know, the, you know, the child might be afraid of uh, trying out for the soccer team or, um, you know, participating in a sports event, but ultimately they do it. Um, you know, the team maybe wins, they get a lot of praise, they, you know, so they, their anxiety habituates to that situation. They get they get used to it, or they they do their report. They make a good grade. Everyone claps at the end. They feel a sigh of relief, and you know they feel a little bit more comfortable the next time they do it. So this is our um, cognitive behavioral model of anxiety. Um, so this is the known, what's known as the cognitive triangle. So. Um, this is just to give you a sense of how anxiety can become stamped in for people. Um, so what you see is that, you know, we have thoughts that enter our minds. So um, we could call these automatic negative thoughts. Um, these thoughts create um, feelings for us. Um, and ultimately these feelings cause us to, uh, to act. Um, in certain ways to behave. And ultimately this behavior um, just justifies or reinforces our thoughts. So um, an example of um, COVID related thoughts might be, you know, this is never going to get any better. Um, you know, there's, there's not enough supplies to go around so that, you know, two different kinds of thoughts. Ultimately what you'll see is the, you know, having these thoughts makes you makes you worried, overwhelmed, frustrated. Um, and then what you might see is that, you know, all of a sudden you're you're focusing on every piece of new new news that comes out about about COVID. Um, you're frantically buying things, maybe you're extreme engaging in extreme avoidance of others, rigid cleaning schedules. And ult ultimately what this does is just serves to um, you know, stamp in these thoughts. It just reinforces or justifies the thoughts um, that you were having and the cycle continues. So it's really just a vicious, a vicious cycle. 
So, you know, it's, it's pretty normal. Um, you know, go, just going back to this slide, it's pretty normal for, for all of us to have, have thoughts like this. Um, but it's, it's not the case for everyone that it, it necessarily turns into a vicious cycle. Um, but for some people it does and it can become crippling. So how do we recognize um, anxiety that has become a problem? So um, intensity is one of the ways. So is the, is the anxious reaction in line with the actual perceived, perceived threat or is it excessive? So that's one way to think about it. Um, frequency, how many times a week or a, per day um, is, is anxiety um, a focus? Or are you noticing a bit, or you know, how many times a day or a week are you noticing a behavioral um, reaction? Um, how long uh, or how far, I guess, how, for how long does anxiety persist beyond the actual um, occurrence of this uh, perceived threat as well? That's another way to look at it. And also thinking about the, the perceived threat itself, you know, what is the nature of it? Is, is it actually innocuous? Is it actually not really that harmful in a, you know, in an objective way, um, you know, to, to warrant such a reaction. Also, also we can think about, um, you know, how spontaneous um, is their anxious reaction? Um, you know, are they reacting to, um, to, you know, to nothing ultimately? So, you know, are they, are they having a reaction in that's, um, very uh, acute or, you know, happening without the stimulus being present ultimately, without um, actual event uh, being imminent. Um, and then, you know, we also wanna think about interference. So, um, you know, what, how, how, does, how does anxiety interfere in, you know, your child's, um, responsibilities. So, you know, what is your child's job? Um, you know, a child, a child's job is ultimately to, to go to school. That's one of the things it's to, to be a, um, to contribute to the household, to, um, you know, be a, a good older or younger sibling, to um, be well-rounded, engage in their, you know, extracurricular activities sometimes, things like that. So, how does anxiety interfere in all of those things? How does it interfere in um, the family routine, um, the schedule, uh, staying on track, all of those things? And, and as I was saying before, sometimes parents won't see um, or won't notice this kind of interference, especially if, they're, they don't, if their child doesn't voice an anxious worries or concerns. Sometimes what you'll see instead is avoidance if you really look back and think about it. So, you know, maybe your child didn't try out for, um, you know, a, a team or, you know, a band, but, and maybe you didn't think anything of it. Maybe you thought that was just because of interests, but maybe it was actually because of anxiety. Um, and distress is another way to look at it. You know, we, we all feel anxious from time to time, but how much, you know, how crippling is that anxiety? Um, how much emotional distress do these, do these thoughts and worries cause? You know, is, is the child crying? Um, are they, you know, having a tantrum? Are they, you know, holed up in their bedroom, not wanting to talk to anybody? And then for how long has it been going on? Um, some parents, you know, may listen and, and, you know, recognize some of these things in their, in their own ch children. Um, some parents describe their kids as a worry wart. So, you know, and, and, and parents, when they have multiple kids, can kind of compare them to each other in these ways and, um, you know, think, okay, well, yeah, my youngest definitely has always been anxious from the time they were, you know, five. So, you know, how long have these things um, persisted? ultimately. 
And then, you know, we also wanted to touch on um, anxiety in the context of obsessive compulsive disorder because, you know, as uh, Dr. Pasantini was saying, um, OCD is, um, it's the second most common co-occurring condition um, in individuals with Tourette syndrome. So um, in terms of, you know, recognizing if, if this may be becoming a problem, uh, we may see um, uh, hyper focus or awareness of the all the latest um, COVID nineteen related news and events. Um, you may notice um, that your child is worrying um, excessively about uh, either contracting COVID nineteen or giving it to others. So um, harm related worries, um, increased increased time spent washing hands. So um, you know, we realize it's, it's you, during these times, we all need to make sure we're washing our hands, but, um, you know, going above and beyond the recommendations or washing when you, you haven't been in contact with anything or, you know, haven't, um, you haven't really been exposed in a way that you need to wash or doing it in a ritualized way. These are all signs that, um, you know, it's, it's becoming uh, excessive, the, the reaction. Um, and, I'll, and I'll touch more on that a little bit later too. Um, but also, you know, excessive concerns um, regarding cleaning and also unritualized cleaning as well. So, you know, we all need to, to you know, to make sure that we're um, disinfecting, but, you know, they're within, within reason, ultimately. Um, and then avoidance. What you might see is that um, your child is maybe asking somebody else to touch things for them instead of doing it themselves. So completely avoiding um, having to come into contact. Okay. Great. And um, just to, to add um, on what Emily was saying about OCD, we do see a lot of, like I said earlier, we do work with a lot of OCD kids and um, it can be a little tricky to distinguish between what's COVID hygiene and what is actually OCD. And I, I just wanted to reemphasize the points that Emily made, which were, which were, um, you know, that that kids follow the guidelines, you know, for CDC in terms of washing and all. But if your child is washing 20 or 30 or 40 minutes at a time, which we do see with some kids, or three showers a day, um, that's probably that may be COVID exacerbated OCD, but we would consider that OCD and we would, um, that would be something that we would, we would work on. But let's, um, let's change focus a little bit now. Um, we've talked about what anxiety looks like, how to recognize it when it becomes problematic. So let's talk more about management now. What can you as parents or, or educators do um, to help, to help the kids? And um, the first and foremost thing I think is, is that even though these are different times and we are stressed and our kids are stressed um, and, and, you know, reality is, has been morphed a little bit um, by just the way we're all living now, we still need to pay attention to the basic management principles. And some things haven't changed in terms of how we manage ticks um, and manage anxiety even. So these, um, the, uh, these are um, a set of guidelines that we have developed um, that really are kind of the, the, um, the Ten Commandments of how you manage ticks at home, um, perhaps. And this comes from our research uh, that we've done. And when I'm talking about us, I mean, you know, the broader, the broader number of researchers throughout the Tourette Association um, that focus on behavioral treatments and, and management of, of ticks. So, um, and, and the, the general tenet, kind of the underlying um, model behind this is, is that if we react to our kids' ticks, if we tell our kids not to tick, or if we get angry at them, or if we comfort them when they're ticking, that's likely to increase their ticks. It's, it's a behavioral learning principle. We learn things and we do things more often when they are reinforced or when they're rewarded. And that can be attention, it can be whatever it is, and even, and even um, negative forms of attention. If we tell a child to stop ticking or get angry at a child for ticking or doing other kinds of unwanted behaviors, 
what that does paradoxically is it increases the child's um, arousal that makes them a little more nervous or anxious because this is something that they have a hard time controlling. And so they start paying more attention to their tick urges or their tick signals or their ticks, which actually makes them tick more. So the things that we do to try to get our kids to stop ticking oftentimes make them worse. And the things we do to comfort our kids when they're ticking, if we do them in the moment, can reward or reinforce the ticks and it can make the ticks worse as well. And this isn't like manipulation. This isn't something that the kids are doing on purpose. It's very basic behavioral learning or conditioning um, of the ticks. So the, the first thing we teach in our clinic, in our workshops and in our talks is do not react to your child's ticks in the moment. The child is ticking, you want to ignore the ticks. If the child has a self-injurious tick, um, like eye poking or pinching or something like that, or or hitting the sis his sister or or your daughter, you know, punching her brother because it's a tick. Um, we need to manage that. I mean, we, we don't want to let our kids hurt ourselves, but we want to do it in as neutral a way as possible. Um, we don't want to express frustrations um, or upset or concerns or worries about um, kids' ticks when the child is present, because that can make kids more self-conscious and that can increase their anxiety. I can't believe, I can't stand it when you tick all the time. I just, it's driving me crazy or telling dad or, or dad telling mom, I just don't know what to do. I'm so frustrated with, with Billy's ticks or the teacher saying, I can't teach this kid. I just don't know what, that's gonna make the kid, um, the child feel a lot more self-conscious and that is assuredly going to increase anxiety and increase ticking. We want it so when you need to, what we tell our, what we tell our parents um, in clinic is that if your child, if you are getting frustrated and you're kind of at the, at the end of your rope because it's just so frustrating or you're so tired or so worn out, it's fine to vent. It's fine to, to talk about these frustrations, but you don't want to do it in a setting where the child or other, other um, kids in the family might hear. You want to make sure you're doing that in private. What I, tell, what I tell parents half jokingly, but not completely, is if you are that frustrated, go for a walk around the block. And um, when you're out of earshot, scream at a tree or drive somewhere or go in the bathroom and turn up the music um, because we do, it is hard and we do need to get our frustrations out. We need to seek consultation. We need to seek support from others. But again, we don't want it to be in front of the child. The next thing is we want really the focus to be on, on our kids' strengths and positives and focusing on the positives and trying to reinforce and pay attention to the things we would like to see more of. Um, that can be difficult at times. Um, in treatment and behavior therapy, you know, there is a role for parents certainly to support kids and, and reinforce or or um, reward them for when they're engaging in, in their tick management strategies that they've learned. But we don't want all the interactions just to be about ticks. And that, that can be easy to do sometimes, um, is, or about the anxiety or about the OCD. We really want to try to not have our relationships center on these things that we're trying to reduce, but rather on the things we're trying to increase. And the other thing that's really important and sometimes gets, lo gets lost is um, expectations for a long time, um, kids with ticks and other, and other um, emotional or behavioral problems, um, we were gentle with them and, and really kid gloves and perhaps had lowered expectations. Well, well, my child probably isn't going to be able to do some of the things as kids without ticks or without anxiety because of these symptoms. We really want to try to avoid that and really want to have, have realistic, but we want to have high expectations for our kids and treat them as such. And don't, 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 don't treat them as being diminished in any sense. And this goes back to really focusing on the strengths. Um, next. Um, so I know this is aspirational. It is, um, we want to try to do the best we can with all of these things. I know it's not always easy. Um, to do this. And as parents, I'm a parent myself, it's not easy to do it with my kids either. But these are things that we really would like to, to, um, to try to work towards the best that we can. 
more specifically, more concrete things, and this may come up um, in some of your, your questions, keep your kids mentally and physically busy. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this as we, as we get farther on. This is a lot harder now in COVID because the kids, it's harder for them to be physically active. Uh, mentally, if they're not spending as much time in school, I mean, that leaves a big vacuum that's usually filled by computers and online time and et cetera. But we wanna try to keep our kids active. We wanna try to keep them uh, reasonably scheduled and in a reasonably structured environment, albeit with sufficient flexibility depending on the specific needs that they might have. Um, screen time, no doubt, has exploded. Everybody, uh, parents too, are, you know, adults are, we have to do screen time to stay socially active, socially connected. And that's okay, but we want to monitor this and we want this to be somewhat careful about how much screen time kids can have. Screen time for socialization is important. Obviously for school, it's important. Even for some games and fun and video games, there may be a role for video games. And um, potentially even, even some increase in video game time versus before because the kids do need to maintain activity and be stimulated, especially activities or games that would be social in nature. Um, if this is the only way that, you're, that your child can interact with their best friend is playing video games or is on screen time, then we're gonna need to do some of that and tolerate some of that because the social connection is so important. But we know that video games and we know that TV are the two largest exacerbators of tics. In our studies, we've asked what situations tend to trigger worsening tics or in what situations does your child tend to tick the most? And video games is at the top of the list and TV is, at the, is second on the list. So short periods of time, um, if, if your child starts ticking or getting agitated or more anxious um, or impulsive, then it's time to take a break. But we need, to, we need to manage this because there really are not as many other routines. Physical activity as well, um, doing physical Zoom, for example, exercising with other kids over Zoom or exercising in the backyard or, yard or on the sidewalk or driveway or in the house. Establish bedtime routine. When things go out of whack with, with working from home and, or doing school from home, the bedtime routines get messed up and we know that's so important is to keeping a routine, routine bedtime, making sure kids get enough sleep. Same with diet, good diet, healthy diet, same with exercise. Kids can't get enough exercise, especially kids with Tourette's. And remind your child to relax when stressed. We all get stressed out and we forget to monitor what we're doing. When we see the stress levels going up, when we see the anxiety going up in our kids and more importantly in ourselves, then we need to take time to, to, to take a break. And um, let's talk about a couple of ways that we can, we can do that. Uh, next slide, please. So, you know, this is trite and almost every parenting talk I go to and every parenting talk I give, we always use the example. When you're on the airplane and they say, put your oxygen mask on first, then your child's, they say that for a reason. We say the same thing. If you are stressed or ready to blow, you are not gonna be able to, your, to parent your child in a manner that's gonna calm them down. So whatever we do for our kids, we really need to do for ourselves. So the next couple of slides is we have a few different exercises that we can, that we use a lot in our clinics. Um, we use a lot personally um, that might be helpful. And these are really low tech. These are really simple things. They're not gonna take the place of therapy if your child really has an anxiety disorder is in, and is in therapy. They're not going to solve all the problems, but in the moment, some of these things can be pretty helpful. And I also wanna note that um, this butterfly breath and some of the other things we're gonna be talking about, you can find a lot of this information on um, our CARE Center website. So um, um, Emily and I are both involved with the UCLA CARE Center, which stands for Child Anxiety Resilience Education and Support. And it's a resource for parents of kids with anxiety, um, OCD, Tourette's, and related disorders. And we have a ton of information on this website about how to manage your child in the time of COVID, about managing screen time. Um, there's some stuff on about OCD. There's some about Tourette's. We're, we're building more information for Tourette's. So, I would encourage you to check it out because a lot of the stuff we're talking about comes from information on that website. So butterfly, butterfly breath is um, a surprisingly easy and, and somewhat addictive anxiety management strategy. 
And it simply is um, exactly what it looks like. I mean, the palm of your hand and you're tracing a butterfly, you're doing figure eights on your palm and we call it butterfly. And as you're doing it, you're timing your breath. So as you do the circle on the left here, breathe in. And as you do the circle on the right, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And you just do this a few times until you, until you are able to relax a little bit. Um, I, I oftentimes tell the kids that I work with, just take a couple of deep breaths, you know, in, out, in, out. Butterfly breath is a way to anchor that a little bit. Um, and that can be surprisingly effective um, if it's done early enough in the sequence. Next slide. Um, progressive muscle relaxation. We use this in our clinical treatment quite a bit. Sitting in a chair and um, variously scrunching, squeezing various various muscle groups. Typically, we start with you can start with our face and squeeze, hold it for a couple seconds, and relax. And this does a couple of things. And then you go down your body and and do do the whole the various body parts. The first thing is by squeezing the muscles and then relaxing relaxing you're reducing muscle tension. So it's a nice way if you're feeling really tense is you kind of squeeze it up and then you relax. The other thing it is, is by doing the squeezing, you can feel the tension, you can feel the tightness. And when you relax, it really, really accentuates or maximizes the contrast between what it feels like when I feel tense and what it feels like when I feel relaxed. And of course you do this when you're, when you're breathing. And there, there are a number of places to get more, there's scripts for how to do this I'm in a little more detail on the CARES website. You can also find this in other places. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is another way of doing muscle relaxation for younger kids. So we can use different types of um, different types of analogies. So we will do like um, squeezing your muscles like a robot, you know, or a monster or whatever, and now relax like a like a floppy doll. Um, you can do it that way. Um, one of the things for scrunching your face would be pick up a lemon, a super sour lemon, or like a sour patch candy, um, which my kids all love. I can't stand them. They're too sour, but you know, do that. Um, and that makes you squeeze. Okay, now spit it out and relax. The other kinds of breathing exercises we use for young kids can be fun too. So we have um, cake and candles. Imagine it's your birthday and your favorite kind of cake is sitting in front of you. Take a big smell of the cake. So blow out the candles or mm, hot chocolate chip cookies fresh out of the oven. Let's take a big breath. Mm, they smell good, but they're too hot. So let's blow on them to cool them off. All sorts of fun activities you can do with little guys um, like that. Next slide, please. And then there are other types of grounding exercises. And these are good for kids, older kids. They're also good for adults. And we talk about this to five, four, three, two, one coping technique or coping with your senses. And when you're feeling kind of like you're getting at the, the end of your rope, you know, just sit back and, and just take a couple breaths. We start any exercise with a couple of, of breaths and just acknowledge five things that you can see around you. The screen, the window, my printer, my coffee cup, my mouse, and the tree through the window. Acknowledge four things that you can touch around you. My filing cabinet, my monitor, my arm, my hair, my pen. Acknowledge three things that you can hear around you. My voice, my dog in the other room, my kids running around outside, a bird chirping, the wind. Acknowledge two things that you can smell right now. I can't really smell anything right now. I'm in a little room and I'm a little uh, congested, but you can figure something out and acknowledge one thing that you can taste around you. Well, I have a cup of coffee here. I wish it was a donut. And just, it takes like 30 seconds and just, just settles you in. It's like a circuit breaker. And I tell my kids don't really remember in the old days when our computers would always freeze or our phones would freeze or whatever we had would freeze, the cable would freeze. You push the reset button, it would turn off. It would turn back on and it would work. This is all just like, like pushing a reset button. Yeah. So this is this is um, a great mindfulness um, technique to keep us present, focused. So when we're worried, you know, sometimes we're, we're worried about things in the future that are going to happen, or we're, you know, we're hyper focused on things that happened in the past. And so 
this is um, helpful to ground you in the present, keep you present focused. Okay. And this is, oh, this is also mine, and then mm -hmm. we switch. Um, the other thing is with Tourette's, um, managing Tourette's in public, um, remember the public when we used to go out in public? Well, if we ever do get back out into public, and some of us do venture out, albeit masked and, 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 and spritzed with our stuff and everything, um, but if you are in settings, um, and kids really do have a lot of ticking, and we have this, we, we um, you know, especially with coprolalia, or kids that, that happen to, or young adults that, um, you know, that have vocal tics that, in, that contain content that may be profane or it may be, it may be difficult um, to do. There may be, there may be um, you know, subcoprolalia commonly kids may use um, words that, you know, would violate um, racial or gender um, norms. And that can be pretty difficult. And we've worked with certainly a number of kids that have been in difficult situations as a result of this. Um, including going through um, going through checkpoints at airports mm -hmm. um, and saying things that that they, they shouldn't say, uh, which is a, which is a tick a characteristic of the tick. So um, the Tourette Association has this really great resource, and the link is right here, and you can actually download and print a card. So if you are in a situation where you do your child or or you or whoever. Um, does engage in a socially inappropriate vocalization or behavior, um, you, can, you can use this court card. And uh, similar to a lot of the materials, it's in uh, Spanish as well. So this is a really nice resource that the Tourette Association um, presents. Yeah, so, um, and this one is focused, um, so this is a new one that they created specifically for the current times with COVID, um, you know, because as we talked about before, with you know, coughing and sniffing, ticks that mimic um, other kinds of symptoms. We want to make sure that we keep you out of tense uh, situations. Um, so this is this is their COVID-related card, but then they do also have a standard card as well um, that addresses uh, you know other kinds of ticks like coprolalia too. Okay, I'm glad you said that. I didn't recognize that this was a new card. I thought it was the regular one. So that's really <laughs> cool. That's really yeah. great. All right, so now we're going to turn back towards um, anxiety um, and management. So um, in terms of managing anxiety, uh, one of the great tools to use with kids is um, externalizing your child's anxiety. And so um, what we mean by this is, is finding a way to separate your child's anxiety from them. So anxiety is a problem, but your child is not the problem. You know, sometimes um, children can get the, the sense that they are, you know, a problem child or they're, you know, troublesome. And, you know, when that can kind of uh, put them on the defensive and it can make it hard for them to work through it. Um, and so this just helps, uh, helps your kid learn that, you know, the anxiety is the issue, but not them. And the way that we do this is, um, you know, we can name the anxiety. So, you know, this would be like a little green monster here. Um, we can have them, you know, draw the anxiety if they're a little bit younger. Um, and, and, and when, you know, your child might be having, when you're noticing some anxious thoughts creeping in, you know, you might say, you know, is, it, is, it, is the little green monster in your ear again? Um, so we're, you know, really referring to that anxiety as, as, an, as an entity in a way. So um, this uh, labeling of anxiety in this way can be um, really helpful. Um, also, you know, as much as, you, as possible, avoid providing that reassurance. So remember before we talked about how kids with anxiety tend to ask you repeated questions that they've already asked you. They also just ask for reassurance that everything's going to be okay. And you know, what do you notice about when you, when you give reassurance? Does your child stop asking you these questions? No, they don't stop asking you. So they continue to ask you. So ultimately, even though it feels like you're helping in the moment, and yes, in the moment, there is a short-term reduction in anxiety. What's happening is um, it's really creating a cycle because it, it doesn't, it doesn't last. And, you know, they're, 
their repeat asking is already excessive. So you give, you know, you providing that reassurance isn't actually helping at that point. We have to break the cycle. So what can you do instead? You know, um, you can you can reference the anxiety by naming it. Um, you can redirect you can also say you know i've already answered that question um, or i think you know the answer to that question um, and you know and that that's your response um, another another tool that's helpful is to especially surrounding covid is to share share the facts as you know them so you know we don't know everything that's going to happen we don't know everything that is happening all over the world um, or even across the United States, because you know every state is almost like its own little, um, you know, microcosm. And so there are, we're all at different stages across the nation in terms of uh, the COVID response and how much it's affecting the people. Um, so, you know, it's it's helpful for for kids to see that you you don't know everything either. And part of anxiety is learning to tolerate uncertainty. Um, and so what you're doing is modeling that, you know, that tolerance of uncertainty, you know, you know what you know, but you don't know more than that and, and you're okay. Um, so they will be okay as well. Also, you'll want to, you know, it's fine to share information from the news, but you do, you do want to keep it um, to the minimum, but you also want to present information from trusted sources too, and you can tell them where you heard it, you know, so yeah, I read in the newspaper or I read on this news website that, you know, this is what's, this is what's happening. This is what's going on with COVID right now. Um, and, you know, that way your kids are getting the message that they should be, you know, if they're going to be checking the news, they should be checking reputable um, websites, reputable print sources, um, but not, you know, not looking on reactionary, fear-mongering um, sources and things like that. Um, and then you do want to limit close monitoring of the news. If, you, if you're sensing that your child is pretty sensitive to, um, you know, focusing on what they hear and, um, you know, perseverating on it too. It's also important to provide structure. So, you know, when you're, when you're feeling anxious and that you don't have anything else to do, you know, the anxiety can just take over. So it's, you know, it's important to make sure that you you fill your child's time with um, activities. Um, now that they're returning to school, that will be, you know, um, you know, they will, they will naturally have uh, more to do anyway, but, um, but yeah, it's important to have some kind of schedule. Um, it does not need to be rigid. Um, should be flexible, but I think it's important to keep them busy. And also engaging in physical activity is um, is great as well. Um, and then using the relaxation tools that we just discussed, so grounding the um, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 coping technique, um, re relaxed breathing or diaphragmatic breathing, so the belly breath or, or butterfly breath, tracing, um, and then the progressive muscle relaxation too. So, so using those um, relaxation tools when they're feeling um, tense, um, but also, you know, modeling, making sure to model positive coping um, strategies yourself. So remember we talked about the cognitive triangle. So thoughts um, create feelings, feelings influence your behaviors, what you do, and then what you do kind of feeds back into your thoughts, creating a loop. So it justifies your thoughts and we want to break the cycle. So um, you're going to need to try to challenge your own worry thoughts too. And some of this perhaps you should do out loud. So, you know, you're, so that your child um, understands the process too. So this is an example, this table at the bottom, but uh, you know, an unhelpful thought or also called an automatic negative thought, we're all gonna get sick and be hospitalized. So, you know, naturally you feel really anxious. Um, Behavior would be seeking reassurance, um, you know, from from mom and dad. Uh, are we going to be okay? Is grandpa going to be okay? Um, and ultimately, this our unhelpful thoughts can be um, kind of 
categorized as different um, kind of uh, what we would call thinking traps or cognitive biases. Um, and this one falls under catastrophizing. So thinking the absolute worst in a situation, taking it to the extreme. Um, and ultimately, we, we just want to be able to recognize that, that cognitive bias or thinking trap, that our thinking is falling into that. And we want to challenge that by making, you know, thinking of a more balanced thought, you know, so um, a more balanced thought is that, you know, our family is informed and we are doing the best we can to stay safe. So, you know, nobody is perfect, but we, we are aware of the, the current events. We are aware of the situation and we are doing the best we can. Um, and so modeling that for your child can be helpful. And also, you know, praising your child's um, efforts to manage anxiety is important too. So when you see them using, you know, deep breathing, when you, um, you know, you see that they were able to redirect um, themselves from, you know, asking you, you know, reassurance seeking, or um, they were able to shift their focus, their attention, it's great to praise them uh, for what they're doing. And then, you know, we wanted to touch on, you know, managing uh, OCD related anxiety also. And so, um, you know, we were talking about this before, but, you know, we do realize that the lines are, are a, a little bit blurred right now. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, the idea is, that, is to follow this, the basic CDC recommendations for washing and cleaning, um, but, but not go beyond that. So, you know, the recommendation is to wash your hands for 20 seconds, like singing happy, um, happy birthday. What is it? Is it twice, John? I think. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. So, um, washing them with soap and water, um, or, you know, when you can't wash your hands, use hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Um, but it doesn't mean you wash for a minute in scalding hot water. It doesn't mean that you use five pumps of soap. Um, it doesn't mean that you wash your hands and then go wash again in five minutes if you haven't, you know, exposed yourself to anything. So it's, it's important to think about those situations. Again, is there a threat present? Um, you know, if you wash your hands and then go wash them again immediately after, there's no threat present um, to have done that necessarily. So, you know, the recommendation, wash after you know, blowing your nose, coughing, sneezing, using the bathroom, um, you know, when you've touched animals or pets before eating um, or preparing food, or if you're providing assistance where you'd be um, needing to touch someone like a child or someone elderly. Um, and, you know, it is important to disinfect um, high traffic surfaces daily, but within reason. So if you know, you haven't left the house that day at all, you don't need to wipe down the doorknob. You know, if you, if, if no one ate at the kitchen table, you don't need to wipe down the kitchen table. Um, you know, we have to use our, you know, we have to use logic and, and keep it reasonable. Uh, so, you know, in terms of laundering uh, clothing and items, it's important to use, you know, just use the warmest, um, water setting that's allowable and make sure to dry the items completely. Um, and this is just basic guidance. Of course, if somebody, if somebody in the house is known to be ill, then it becomes a different story and you do need to take more steps. But if, if you know, no one, no one is ill yet, then, you know, we're just going to follow basic uh, laundering guidance and you can visit this website too. And also groceries was another point of, um, concern for the public at one point in time at least, and it might still be, but the US um, uh, Food and Drug Administration guidelines do, do not include disinfecting of perishable and non-perishable grocery items. That's not something that they suggest. Um, so you, that is not something you need to do. Now they do recommend washing your hands after you've gone to the grocery store because you may have touched the shopping cart and, and those kinds of things. Um, or the payment system, but, but you don't need to wipe down the actual groceries themselves. 
Um, and remember that, you know, there is no perfect cleaning routine. So, you know, disinfecting, that, that should take a few minutes. It doesn't need to take hours. Um, so, you know, that's another important reminder. How long is it taking? How rigidly is it done? Is it becoming done in a certain order? Um, you know, we need to think about about those things. And then, but, and you, you as the parent also need to think about your own reaction and how, how you, um, you know, what your cleaning routine is like too. So if, um, you know, you may need to modify the intensity with which, or, or the rigidity with which you clean as well, just to model, um, you know, an appropriate level of precaution. Um, and then, you know, also remember we said there can be some avoidance where, uh, you know, kids may be asking you to do things for them because they don't want to touch um, certain things. Um, what well, we want to reduce, we, we would call that parental or family accommodation, um, depending on who's doing it, we want to reduce that as well. And, you know, if it truly is becoming um, a problem, then, you know, you may need to seek some, some help for your child. Um, you know, if it's taking up too much time or becoming too ritualized, um, or just distressing. And then we wanted to touch on uh, returning um, to school as well. So, um, you know, ultimately we know that ticks tend to uh, worsen at the beginning of the school year. Um, so, you know, and especially, you know, with anxiety about returning, it's a novel situation. Um, and so, you know, kids also might be worried about how other kids will react to their tics. Um, they might worried about having a, might be worried about having a new teacher who maybe doesn't know that they have um, tics and they don't know how the teacher will react. Um, so it's, you know, it's important to, to check in with your child about any worries they might have about starting the school year um, and, and try to address them as best you can. Also, you know, we know that um, sometimes kids with Tourette syndrome have individualized education plans um, to, you know, to manage Tourette syndrome at school or a, or a 504 plan as well. And so um, it would be good to just connect with the school and make sure that any accommodations for Tourette syndrome or any other kinds of learning impairments or ADHD, you know, it obviously, it obviously depends on what the plan and the IEP are for but we wanna make sure that those accommodations are in place. Um, and when we talk about accommodations, what we're talking about is, for example, you know, have, being given extra time on tests or being able to um, you know, take a little break from class and go to, you know, for example, the, um, the nurse's office or a, you know, a, a different classroom where they can, um, you know, be by themselves for a little bit before returning. Um, so yeah, those are, those are all examples. Or maybe for some other kinds of problems, it might be that they should be sitting at the front of the classroom. Or maybe in other cases, it would be that they should be sitting at the back. So those are all just different kinds of um, accommodations. And then, you know, not all kids with Tourette's syndrome obviously have those kinds of plans. They may not all need them, but, but sometimes it's still a concern that um, you know, the social piece of school and, and the reactions to, to ticks can still, still be a problem. Um, so, you know, for general concerns about how teachers or peers may react, um, I think it's important to make sure that the, your child has planned out what they will say if a teacher or peer asks about ticks. So making sure they just know up front. Um, you know, and for example, there may be, for some kids, they may be pretty comfortable just saying, you know, I have Tourette syndrome or I have tics or I have these movements that, you know, happen without me in, intending to or I these sounds that come out without, without me intending them to and um, that's, what that, that's what you're hearing or seeing. But for other kids who maybe have, um, you know, milder tics or, or maybe they, they do still have moderate or more severe tics, they might not be comfortable um, sharing this with other, with other people. So they, they need to come up with what they're going to say. Um, and it, 
And in some cases, it may be necessary for at least the teacher to know, even if the peers don't know, um, just to make sure there aren't any misunderstandings. Sometimes teachers, you know, if there's an eye rolling tick, they will think that, you know, the child is rolling their eyes at them, or, you know, if they, they're making um, noises uh, or they're having vocal tics, they, you know, they don't understand and think it, it might be defiance. And so we want, we need to minimize those confusions um, and misunderstandings um, to make sure that the teacher's not forming any bias, some unnecessary bias against um, your child's behavior. So, um, so if, you know, if it's really needed, um, and it, it, it could be helpful to connect with the child's school to make sure the teachers are aware of, you know, Tourette symptoms. Um, the Tourette Association of America also um, has um, education in service um, to where they can educate school staff. Um, back when I was in graduate school, I, I had completed one for a family. So ultimately, you know, this would involve going um, to the school and just um, providing education on what Tourette syndrome is and um, and what it looks like to um, the teachers and staff and the principal and just making sure that everybody uh, knows um, what it is so they can recognize it and not misunderstand it. Um, and then for the peer situations, um, the Tourette Association actually does have a youth ambassador program um, as well. So this is where they, um, they train uh, youth who do have Tourette syndrome to um, be to advocate for others, um, and so you know really they are peer leaders, and um, they, you know, part of their role it might be to go to a school and um, talk about Tourette's, um, you know, in, in an assembly or in a classroom. And these are um, just some Tourette Association resources. So there are many more resources on um, uh, the Tourette Association of America website, but these are really cool because they are um, what they call toolkits. Um, and so they, they have them for patient and patients and families. They have them for, uh, for kids. So, in, in, so that a child can understand what Tourette's is. They have them for, for young adults. They also have them for, for treatment providers, but also for teachers um, and educators, and even for law enforcement too. So for the for police departments, making sure that the police understand what Tourette syndrome is. Okay, and now um, Dr. Pasantini will talk about our Tourette Association Center of Excellence. Right. Um, we're running a bit over. Thank you yeah. for staying with us. Sorry. So we're gonna go <laughs> through this description in about five minutes. <laughs> maybe shorter, maybe three minutes. Um, um, but because um, we want to save time, time for questions. Um, but we are on the center. We were, we were um, fortunate to be um, designated in the first wave of the centers, and um, it's a really, it's a really great program. So um, I direct the center along with uh, Jim McCracken, who is a child psychiatrist that some of you may know, and Yvette Bordelon is a co-director, and she is from the Department of Neurology. Um, next slide, please. And um, we provide a pretty broad array of services. You know, unlike um, there are some centers of excellence that are primarily clinical and they have, you know, very large caseloads of Tourette's. At UCLA, we're a little bit different because we are, um, first of all, we're a medical school. So our primary goal um, is to provide training. So I think our, our mission is really trying to train uh, the next generation of psychologists and child psychiatrists and neurologists um, and adult practitioners to learn how to recognize and treat Tourette's using uh, behavior therapy, CBIT, and medication. So our clinic is a bit smaller than some of the other clinics that you might, might see. So those of you that have, have uh, tried to get in, some of you may, may be patients. Um, we, we are pretty small. What the Center of Excellence has allowed us to do is to, um, we're working to develop a network of community providers as well. So if we aren't able to provide services in a timely fashion, then we can, um, you know, we can try to provide some from referrals. And the Tourette Association certainly has a lot of information 
on this as well. And they've been, they've been great partners with us in trying to do that. But we provide, um, one of our specialties is we do CBIT. Um, UCLA was one of the sites uh, for the CBIT studies. Um, and we are very active in uh, continued research with CBIT and doing behavior therapy trainings. We did a training, a CBIT training at UCLA in March, the week before the lockdown. So um, early March, so we were very happy to get that in. So we're working to increase the number of CBIT providers. Um, and, uh, and we do psychopharmacology, we do family therapy, we work with anxiety, OCD, Tourette's, um, hair pulling and skin picking, other related disorders as well. Um, we, um, our clinic, we have an outpatient clinic that we've referred to, um, again, where we, we work with child OCD, anxiety, and tick disorders, also with body-focused repetitive behaviors, uh, med management, school consultation, um, and the like. Um, CBIT, I'm not going to spend time describing CBIT because I just don't think we have the time, but it is a behavioral treatment. Um, we do cognitive behavior therapy, exposure-based therapies for anxiety and OCD. A lot of the kids we work with have ADHD. Some We work with some kids that are mild on the autism spectrum. We have um, autism programs at UCLA. We have a center of excellence for autism at UCLA. So any, any kids that are, that are, that are beyond mild, we usually refer to, to that program, um, but we are able to do treatments. And then we, we work with neurology. There's a movement disorders clinic and they, they do the more neurologic interventions. Um, they, we re refer back and forth. So if it's going to be primarily Tourette's, ADHD, OCD, we will be doing those medications and treatments. Um, we refer for if we do need Botox or other um, more intensive interventions. And then there's also a um, neurosurgery program that we work with led by Nader Ampradian, which is the next slide. Um, and um, we do have a deep brain uh, stimulation protocol for, for very severe treatment resistant Tourette's in, in adults. Um, we um, haven't done too much of that here um, as compared to some of the other centers. And then there is a neuropsychological testing or ADHD treatments. We can do medication for ADHD as long as a child has Tourette's or OCD or anxiety um, as well, but we do have a separate ADHD program um, and that they can do the neuropsychological testing as needed. Um, and also there's a UCLA psychology, Department of Psychology clinic that can provide some of these services as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as uh, Dr. Costantini was saying, um, you know, we also do CBIT trainings. Um, this is locally, nationally, and also internationally. Um, I think you just did one in China, was it last year? Um, yeah, it was the uh, first CBIT training in China, um, yeah. which was pretty exciting. Yeah, and then um, we are also uh, working with the community as well to um, provide education. Um, so this is uh, one of the efforts that we've, um, we're working to increase as well. I'm part of the Tourette Association Diversity Committee, um, working to address um, health disparities. So making sure to educate the public is, is uh, one of our, our main um, areas of uh, priority. Um, and then we also have the, the UCLA uh, Care Center, uh, Center for Child Anxiety Res Resilience Education and Support, um, which uh, John directs. And so um, through that, we are hoping to also provide some education to the public on Tourette syndrome too. Um, and then on the horizon, um, we will be working with uh, Shauna Chance to um, uh, ultimately uh, do some uh, networking events for providers, treatment providers, and also um, uh, planning a, a research conference that is focused more so on uh, California centers. Um, so this is um, just to take you through um, some of our research faculty and, and research studies. So this is uh, Dr. Sandra Liu. Um, she has a, a brainwave study also as EEG um, for tick disorders. And so um, this is contact information for this particular study. Um, she's looking at the relationship between brainwaves and body movement in um, youth with Tourette's. Uh, this is Dr. Nermi. She, um, she has a study looking at genetic correlates of OCD and related disorders, including Tourette syndrome. Um, and um, this is myself. 
Um, I have uh, research studies looking at circadian rhythms and light therapy in youth and adults with Tourette syndrome. Um, ultimately, um, for our adult one, we, we just wrapped up the main part of it, but there are parts of it that we will um, continue. Um, so you know, be in touch if, if it, you know, you're interested. Um, and then we also have uh, a, a sleep-wake rhythm survey that's happening right now, um, which we're, we're trying to recruit parents and youth for, and we, we finished our adult survey. So. Um, in terms of research on the horizon, um, the echo pipe M trial is, um, is going to be, um, we're gonna be a site for that. So that's gonna be something that will be upcoming. And then also um, Big Tick. So this is a longitudinal Tourette's imaging study to see how um, ultimately um, the brain-based brain factors uh, may predict um, the way in which ticks persist over time. Um, so this is ultimately under review um, right now at the National Institute of Mental Health. So um, we don't know if we have it, but um, it could be on the horizon. All right, let's move to questions. I've been answering some questions in the um, in the chat um, okay. during this, and um, you know, some of the big so one of the questions that came up is like, what do we do to keep our kids busy? <laughs> it's so right. hard, and you know, we've tried to address some of this. I've, I've posted a couple of links to some information on the. Mm -hmm on the um on the chat but um it you know it's every every child is going to be different kids with Tourette's and ADHD and anxiety they're going to be more challenging but um there's some there's some pretty creative ways out there of, of trying to keep kids focused and keep kids scheduled I think the social contact is so important if if and a lot of that's going to have to be done virtually at this point but you know, right, the physical practice. activity pieces to like selecting video games that are are more physic are you know and more physically active, um, in, engaging. I would say um, like the Wii stuff of the of yesteryear, like mm -hmm. Wii bowling and things like that. And um, yeah, yeah, I think try yeah trying to maintain some kind of a schedule. For kids like this is study time this is physical time this is video time um, and if there are other different kinds of activities potentially um, they, they, to do so the kids have some sense of predictability and they know that at a certain point during the day they will be doing schoolwork or they will be doing homework and at other times it will be time for physical activity mm -hmm. and at other times they will have game time and just with that structure it can take some of the pressure off um, of kids, but I know it is it is difficult to set that up and monitor that as a very busy parent in the long run though it may pay off because it may help we all we all need structure and predictability, especially anxious kids, especially impulsive kids so um, that would be one thing to try to strive towards yeah, and the things like board games and you know puzzles and things like that, and obviously you know it depends on age, but you know things that they could build, use their hands um, Okay. Uh, other questions? Chat looks. Yeah, I see comments, but not as many. Oh. oh, and just I guess in terms of just housekeeping, a lot of people asked about the presentation slides, and so I will make sure that those are distributed. If for some reason you did not register and you just clicked on the link, I put my email address in the chat, and so. If you send me an email, I will make sure that you've got the presentation slides. And we're also recording this, this presentation. And so once that recording is ready to go, I'll make sure that everyone who's registered or has sent me an email has it as well. So for people who um, didn't watch today, but would still like the slides, do they also need to register to, to get them? Or is this something that will just appear on the website? The slides, I can, we can make sure that those are put on our website. Likely they'll be on the SoCalTAA.org website. Oh, uh, okay. And okay. so, but yeah, but if, you, if you're watching at any point um, this presentation, either live or recorded and, and you want the slides, just send me an email and I'll make sure that you got them. 
Okay. And then, or they could, they could also just register. Yeah. Get, you know, if they haven't watched. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. Good. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to Emily and John for their incredibly informative and interesting presentation. Of course, thank you to Emma Lux for updating us on their research. And thank you all for viewing. We look forward to providing you with more programming in the coming months. So everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.